De Landse Commissie is een, um, ik zou zeggen, een, een, een organisatie die een plek inneemt in het nationale en internationale uh, gesprek, debat, discussie, zo je wilt, over de nationale, maar met name natuurlijk de internationale relaties, buitenlandse politiek, Verenigde Staten met Europa als continent. En dat doen ze op een hele bijzondere manier en al jarenlang. De Atlantische Commissie is voor mij uh, ja, een plek waar ik eigenlijk heel veel uh, heb geleerd. Uh, en ook vooral mijn interesses heel erg heb uitgebreid. Dus waar het heel erg om gaat is uitwisselen van kennis, goed luisteren naar elkaar, verschillende meningen met elkaar aanhoren en daarover discussie kunnen uh, voeren. Dus als het over de transatlantische veiligheidsvraagstukken gaat, heb je al heel snel mijn interesse. En er komen mensen samen die daar graag over willen spreken en vooruitgang willen boeken in hun gedachten. En dat is ook echt iets wat op dit moment uh, met deze timing nodig is. De activiteiten die de Atlantische Commissie doet, dat is ten eerste de bijeenkomsten, publieksbijeenkomsten, dus de discussie, debat. En wat de Atlantische Commissie ook zes keer per jaar publiceert, is dit fantastische blad, Atlantisch Perspectief. En daarin worden schrijvers, genomeerde schrijvers, uh, gevraagd te reflecteren, te schrijven over actualiteit, of het nou cyber is, of het is de verkiezingen, of het is de Europese Unie, of het gaat over brexit, allemaal in relatie tot buitenlands beleid en defensie. En dat kunnen tegengestelde meningen zijn, dat maakt het ook heel boeiend. Maar dat is een heel waardevol uh, blad. Ten tweede, een hele belangrijke die eruit voortkomt, is natuurlijk onderwijs. Ja, ik zit bij de Atlantische Onderwijscommissie. En dat is een, een onderdeel van de Atlantische Commissie en dat houdt zich echt bezig met uh, het op een, een zo goed mogelijke manier deze uh, internationale betrekkingen bij leerlingen te brengen. We proberen verschillende doelgroepen te bereiken en we doen dat bijvoorbeeld voor uh, HVisten en VWO's met een uh, uitschrijven van een profielwerkstuk, een wedstrijd. En dan mogen leerlingen dus aan meedoen, mogen ze zich voor inschrijven. Daarnaast uh, doen we nascholingsconferenties houden voor uh, uh, docenten, maar ook voor studenten. En dan proberen we allerlei uh, actuele thema's aan de orde te stellen. En uh, daarnaast hebben we een studiereis waar uh, docenten zich voor kunnen inschrijven. Steeds met een ander onderwerp natuurlijk. En uh, meestal is dat naar de Verenigde Staten. En daarnaast maken we dus lesbrieven die uh, scholen kunnen bestellen. Ja, we krijgen wel eens uh, reacties die zeggen dat ze materiaal waard, ons materiaal waardevol vinden, omdat het een toevoeging is. Een uh, docent houdt zich vaak aan het curriculum, dat wat gegeven moet worden voor het examen. Wij proberen daar wel een beetje omheen te bewegen. Dat we zeggen, het moet wel bij het curriculum passen, maar aan de andere kant mag het ook wel eens ergens anders over gaan. En dan dingen die echt gewoon spelen op dit moment die van belang zijn. Wat ik zelf hoop te bereiken met de Atlantische Commissie is um, wellicht dat we uh, nog meer jongeren zouden kunnen betrekken. Dus we hebben dat Jong Atlantici, dat is echt een heel mooi programma, een hele uh, actieve, enthousiaste jonge mensen. En wat, wat, wat mij wel bezig blijft houden is hoe krijgen we nu deze jonge mensen ook uh, betrokken op een langere termijn. Ik ben bestuurslid bij Jonge Atlantici. Jonge Atlantici is de tak van de Atlantische Commissie die zich richt op studenten en jong professionals. We organiseren inhoudelijke bijeenkomsten over verschillende onderwerpen binnen het thema internationale veiligheid en dan voornamelijk transatlantische betrekkingen. Het levert mij op dat ik studenten leer kennen die dezelfde interesse hebben als ik, maar bijvoorbeeld, uh, kan ik bijvoorbeeld ook mijn netwerk uitbreiden met sprekers die langskomen. Daarnaast uh, heb ik uit mijn bestuurservaring veel geleerd over het organiseren van bijeenkomsten um, en mijn netwerk verder uitgebreid. Eén evenement dat ik heel leuk vond om te organiseren was een Q&A sessie met Karel van Oostrom. Hij was de Nederlandse permanent vertegenwoordiger bij de VN. En in het organiseren van het evenement uh, kwamen we er ook achter dat bijvoorbeeld ook zo iemand die best een hoge positie bekleedt in Nederland super toegankelijk is. En, uh, we hebben toen een onwijs leuk evenement neergezet. Ik raad mensen zeker aan om zich aan te sluiten bij Jonge Advantie. Voor studenten en jong professionals is het een hele mooie kans om hun netwerk verder uit te breiden, maar vooral ook om hun kennis te verdiepen uh, over thema's binnen internationale veiligheid en de transatlantische betrekkingen. Als jij bovenmatig uh, maatschappelijk geëngageerd bent, uh, dan zeker. En um, ik denk dat je in, als je die interesse hebt, kan je ook niet om de Amerikaanse en de transatlantische relatie heen. Uh, dus uh, zeker een aanrader. Iedere bijeenkomst die er is, probeer ik erbij te zijn. En ik haalde ongelooflijk veel kennis vandaan, zodat er ook ik aan het nadenken gezet wordt. Wat gebeurt er nu? Hoe kunnen we vanuit Europa, vanuit Nederland, samenwerken met die Verenigde Staten? Nou, dat, dat is in een 
nutshell, daar zou ik zoveel over te vertellen, maar dat is uh, wat ik voel, denk en vind van die prachtige organisatie Atlantische Commissie. De Atlantische Commissie is een, um, ik zou zeggen, een, een, een organisatie die een plek inneemt in het nationale en internationale uh, gesprek, debat, discussie, zo je wilt, over de nationale, maar met name natuurlijk de internationale relaties, buitenlandse politiek, Verenigde Staten met Europa als continent. En dat doen ze op een hele bijzondere manier en al jarenlang. De Atlantische Commissie is voor mij uh, ja, een plek waar ik eigenlijk heel veel uh, heb geleerd. Um, en ook vooral mijn interesses heel erg heb uitgebreid. Dus waar het heel erg om gaat is uitwisselen van kennis, goed luisteren naar elkaar, verschillende meningen met elkaar aanhoren en daarover discussie kunnen uh, voeren. Dus als het over de transatlantische veiligheidsvraagstukken gaat, heb je al heel snel mijn interesse. En er komen mensen samen die daar graag over willen spreken en vooruitgang willen boeken in hun gedachten. En dat is ook echt iets wat op dit moment uh, met deze timing nodig is. De activiteiten die de Atlantische Commissie doet, dat is ten eerste de bijeenkomsten, publieksbijeenkomsten, dus de discussie, debat. En wat de Atlantische Commissie ook zes keer per jaar publiceert, is dit fantastische blad, Atlantisch Perspectief. En daarin worden schrijvers, genomeerde schrijvers, uh, gevraagd te reflecteren, te schrijven over actualiteit, of het nou cyber is, of het is de verkiezingen, of het is de Europese Unie, of het gaat over brexit, allemaal in relatie tot buitenlands beleid en defensie. En dat kunnen tegengestelde meningen zijn, dat maakt het ook heel boeiend, maar dat is een heel waardevol uh, blad. Ten tweede, een hele belangrijke die eruit voortkomt, is natuurlijk onderwijs. Ja, ik zit bij de Atlantische Onderwijscommissie. En dat is een, een onderdeel van de Atlantische Commissie en dat houdt zich echt bezig met uh, het op een, een zo goed mogelijke manier deze uh, internationale betrekkingen bij leerlingen te brengen. We proberen verschillende doelgroepen te bereiken en we doen dat bijvoorbeeld voor uh, HVisten en VWO's met een uh, uitschrijven van een profielwerkstuk, een wedstrijd. En dan mogen leerlingen dus aan meedoen, mogen ze zich voor inschrijven. Daarnaast uh, doen we nascholingsconferenties houden voor uh, uh, docenten, maar ook voor studenten. En dan proberen we allerlei uh, actuele thema's aan de orde te stellen. En uh, daarnaast hebben we een studiereis waar uh, docenten zich voor kunnen inschrijven. Steeds met een ander onderwerp natuurlijk. En uh, meestal is dat naar de Verenigde Staten. En daarnaast maken we dus lesbrieven die uh, scholen kunnen bestellen. Ja, we krijgen wel eens uh, reacties die zeggen dat ze hun materiaal waard, ons materiaal waardevol vinden, omdat het een toevoeging is. Een uh, docent houdt zich vaak aan het curriculum, dat wat gegeven moet worden voor het examen. Wij proberen daar wel een beetje omheen te bewegen. Dat we zeggen, het moet wel bij het curriculum passen, maar aan de andere kant mag het ook wel eens ergens anders over gaan. En dan dingen die echt gewoon spelen op dit moment die van belang zijn. Wat ik zelf hoop te bereiken met de Atlantische Commissie is um, wellicht dat we uh, nog meer jongeren zouden kunnen betrekken. Dus we hebben dat Jong Atlantici, dat is echt een heel mooi programma en hele uh, actieve, enthousiaste jonge mensen. En wat, wat, wat mij wel bezig blijft te houden is hoe krijgen we nu deze jonge mensen ook uh, betrokken op een langere termijn. Ik ben bestuurslid bij Jonge Atlantici. Jonge Atlantici is de tak van de Atlantische Commissie die zich richt op studenten en jong professionals. We organiseren inhoudelijke bijeenkomsten over verschillende onderwerpen binnen het thema internationale veiligheid en dan voornamelijk transatlantische betrekkingen. Het levert mij op dat ik studenten leer kennen die dezelfde interesse hebben als ik, maar bijvoorbeeld uh, kan ik bijvoorbeeld ook mijn netwerk uitbreiden met sprekers die langskomen. Daarnaast uh, heb ik uit mijn bestuurservaring veel geleerd over het organiseren van bijeenkomsten um, en mijn netwerk verder uitgebreid. Eén evenement dat ik heel leuk vond om te organiseren was een Q&A sessie met Karel van Oostrom. Hij was de Nederlandse permanent vertegenwoordiger bij de VN. En in het organiseren van het evenement uh, kwamen we er ook achter dat bijvoorbeeld ook zo iemand die best een hoge positie bekleedt in Nederland super toegankelijk is. En, uh, we hebben toen een onwijs leuk evenement neergezet. Ik raad mensen zeker aan om zich aan te sluiten bij Jonge Advantasy. Voor studenten en jong professionals is het een hele mooie kans om hun netwerk verder uit te breiden, maar vooral ook om hun kennis te verdiepen uh, over thema's binnen internationale veiligheid en de transatlantische betrekkingen. Als jij bovenmatig uh, maatschappelijk geëngageerd bent, uh, dan zeker. En um, ik denk dat je in, als je die interesse hebt, kan je ook niet om de Amerikaanse en de transatlantische relatie uh, heen. Uh, dus uh, zeker een aanrader. Iedere bijeenkomst die er is, probeer ik erbij te zijn. 
En ik haal er ongelooflijk veel kennis vandaan, zodat er ook ik aan het nadenken gezet word. Wat gebeurt er nu? Hoe kunnen we vanuit Europa, vanuit Nederland, samenwerken met die Verenigde Staten? Nou, dat, dat is in een nutshell, er is zoveel over te vertellen. Maar dat is wat ik voel, denk en vind van die prachtige organisatie Atlantische Commissie. Good afternoon and welcome to a sit-down with U.S. senior Harvard lecturer Catherine Merced. Live from Pakhuis Zwijger in Amsterdam, I would like to welcome all teachers, students and everyone else watching at home or elsewhere to this platform for inspiring guests with a distinguished career in the field of education. And Catherine is certainly one of them. My name is Hans Luijendijk. As the chair of the Atlantic Education Committee, former headmaster, but above all as a teacher, I will be talking with Dr. Catherine Merced. Welcome. Um, Good afternoon. How are you? I'm fine. For you, it's uh, it's a bit early, but uh, nevertheless, we're uh, uh, together in this um, in this event. Uh, let me introduce you briefly for our viewers, um, because you're an award-winning teacher and a longtime faculty member of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Uh, you have devoted your life's work to studying and reforming education. For over 30 years, Catherine has written extensively about school director leadership, mathematics teaching, and the case of method of instruction. Yet above all, she became known for her work in the field of teacher education as a leading advocate of the teaching profession within and beyond the United States borders. Internationally, she has in edited five volumes of cases about classroom and administrative practice in South Africa, Chile, Brazil, and Jordan. And in 2018, she was selected as the Phi Beta Kappa professor. You must explain what that is to, uh, later on of the year at Harvard College. There are some, these are some, just some brief highlights from a very impressive career. And we have only one hour to, uh, at our disposal. So we have to, uh, to hurry to the questions. Um, uh, from myself and from other people. But I, again, want, want to warmly welcome you. And we are very happy that you can join us in this meeting. Live from, I would say, Cambridge, Massachusetts, because that's where you live, but you're now in California, right? That is right. That okay. is right. Okay, and as I told you before, it's, it's, it's a bit early for you, so extra things that you, um, you are here. I want to start off with uh, your own background, a very interesting one, to say the least, because you obtained your bachelor and master degrees in mathematics, but yet pursued your career as a teacher. Could you tell us how you ended up in the field of education and how your background in mathematics has influenced your work? Thank you, Hans, and thank you to everyone who's taken a moment to join us this afternoon. It's always such a pleasure to be able to talk about my love and my passion, which is teaching. Um, when I graduated from undergraduate, I went to Cornell University. I had a degree in theoretical mathematics, and I was faced with a choice of either pursuing a doctorate in theoretical mathematics or pursuing a, what's called a Master of Arts in Teaching of Secondary Mathematics, which is a combination of both education study and mathematics study. And I realized at that moment that I was much too much of a people person and too much of an extrovert to be able to sit in a concrete office with no windows <laughs> and work on an abstract, weird math problem that no one really ever cared about. And so it was an easy choice for me because uh, I was able in teaching to continue my love of my subject, but also to have a vibrant interaction with people and with students. Okay. Okay. Um, you have gathered some fame by uh, offering an immense popular undergrad course named Equity and Excellence in K-12 American schools. In Dutch, the uh, gelijkheid en excellentie in het lager en voortzet onderwijs. Could you tell us what is, what is it that you wanted to achieve through this course? And why do you think hundreds of students line up every year for the lottery to get in? <laughs> well, thank you. 
Um, what I hope to achieve in that course, which is what I hope we all would achieve as teachers, is this balance, which is often a tension between equity and providing access for everyone to high quality learning and excellence. And often one is favored over the other. We may have more students that we put in classrooms and that we teach, but we don't teach to very high levels. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, we try to raise the standard so that we have excellence and we leave many, many students behind. I think the reason the course is so popular with the Harvard College undergraduates is that I really, um, as you may be able to tell through this interview, I grab them by the lapels and I say, why are you here and someone else is not here at this unique institution of higher learning? Yes, there many of them are very capable, mm -hmm. but they've never thought about why some people achieve in our society and other people don't. And I liken the course really to um, water and fish. And the students that are in my classes are high achievers, brilliant, capable. They cross all disciplinary fields, but they're like fish. They don't know that there's water. And so my goal in this course is to take away the scales from their eyes and say, look around you, look at our society and look at the power mm -hmm. of what education can do. All right. All right. And do you, um, in, in, in due time, have contact with your ex-students uh, in order to, to know if they uh, have a career in education? I do. I, that's one of the most fulfilling parts of my, of right. my job right. over the years is being in touch with many former students. Okay. Um, talking about teachers in America, there's a, short, a great shortage of teachers uh, in the U.S. as well as in Holland. Um, how can we make uh, the teaching profession uh, more attractive by... by well, this is, this, is, this has forever been a, been a question, and, and I think one of the ways to make it more attractive is to help people come to understand the power of a teacher. We all, and I hope everyone on the call today can take just uh, two seconds and think about an important teacher in your life. And everyone comes up with someone you know, through their years of education. And when you think about the impact that that person had on you and the opportunity that you would have if you become a teacher to have that impact on someone else, it's very exhilarating. It's very right. exciting. Right. And so to make teaching more attractive, I mean, obviously in our country, we do not pay them well. Um, nor, they in the also, nor, nor in Holland, no. is that true? And I think another often missed point is that we need to restructure the role of the teacher. In our country and perhaps in Holland, people think a teacher is doing her job or his job only when they are in front of students. And in reality, there's much more to the job. There's working with colleagues, there's talking to parents, there's interacting with your headmaster or your director. And if we look at other countries, for example, Japan, um, in the Japanese system, they have much larger class sizes so as to free time for their teachers to work collaboratively. And I think we need to restructure the role of teacher mm -hmm. so that it's not always in a delivery mode in front of a student. Um, and you could say, well, larger class sizes, that must be so much more difficult. In fact, if you have more time to work with other colleagues, then the lessons are developed in a way that could be very effective. And, and it's not, not that much different. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'll just add quickly, Hans, is no, that no, no. Take your time. For, for me, why I teach is because of the intellectual challenge, the puzzle of this human being who is in front of me, who is trying to master whether it's a mathematics concept or a science concept or equity. They're trying to make sense. And so for me to teach is to learn. And if we could, if we could raise that awareness, I think our societies, both yours and mine, um, undervalue teaching 
And at this particular moment with COVID, one of the things that we've seen is a revelation of parents saying, right. I had no idea right. what you were doing and how important it was. Right. Okay. Uh, you are known and that, that figures uh, to make the case that everyone should consider teaching. But doesn't a good teacher require some talent and aptitude for the job? I mean, is teaching something everyone can learn? What do you think? That's, that's a wonderful question. I think, I think everyone can learn to be an, a successful mentor, teacher, coach, parent, uh, individual who guides a younger person. Um, but to be a really exemplary teacher, I think that takes many years and, and this inquisitive mind, this all, right. I am always learning. Mm -hmm. I'm always surprised by something. And that's what keeps me going. If it were the same job for 30 years, I would have died of boredom many years ago. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. In comparison to the U.S. and Holland, uh, we, we talked about the, the teacher shortage. Um, there's another trend uh, I'd like to um, ex experience with you. Um, the so-called feminization of, of the primary education mostly. Is it a problem that so few men are interested in becoming a teacher or is the scale of this issue exaggerated? What do you think? I, I, I would love to see more males uh, involved in elementary education simply for the fact that more teachers of color, more teachers of, of different socioeconomic backgrounds, different gender preferences, because what we are doing beyond teaching the mathematics or the language or the science is we are forming lives. And so that young people have an opportunity to see different models, if you will, in their, in their classrooms, I think is terrifically important mm -hmm. because going back to what I said before, the power of a teacher is so immense that we really, we really need to show students different types of people, different preferences, different hair color, different skin color. And um, it really, it really, I think would behoove us all if we had more men teaching. Mm -hmm. The other, I mean, historically, at least in our country, when I was becoming a teacher, a little bit before I was becoming a teacher, there were only three options for women. You could become a nurse, you could become a social worker, or you could become a teacher. And a concrete example of that is, for example, at the Harvard Business School, you know, 40 years ago, there were two women out of a class of 800. Oh my God. Yeah. And the same thing was true in the medical field. And today, now that has equalized so that we have almost the same number of women as men in business schools or in medical schools. And that has detracted because okay. when I was becoming a teacher or a little bit before I was a teacher, many talented women who might have wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer or, or Whatever. a business yeah. person didn't have the option. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, what makes a great teacher? Uh, our educational system is mostly focused on making students get good results or making them excel. You often stress that a good teacher can have a huge impact on the, of the life of a child. You, you just did so. Do you agree that schools should mo focus more on making teachers excel as well? Absolutely. But, uh, I mean, the, 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 the really power, here's, here's a statistic to ponder. Mm -hmm. Children, at least in the United States, represent 20% of our population, and they are 100% of our future. What could be more important? Mm -hmm. What could contribute more to society than having good teachers in, in classrooms? Right. It's the only way that our society, and frankly, my country, which is as you all are well aware, been through some pretty challenging and still is going through some very challenging times. It's the only way we will survive. Okay. Uh, what distinguishes an average or good teacher from an excellent one? What, what's the difference? Yes. Well, um, I think, you know, to again, circle back to what I said before, I think 
everyone can learn the skills of teaching, but what distinguishes a good exemplary teacher is their ability to look and put the child first. We know that beginning teachers and teacher education program go through essentially three stages. The first stage is when they start to teach, they're all focused on themselves. Is, is, my, is my dress proper? Do I, is my tie straight? <laughs> am, am I going to be embarrassed in front of these you know, eight-year-olds? There's a total inward focus. And then as teachers become more comfortable, they begin to think about the curriculum. What am I teaching? Do I have my facts right? Did I, do I understand osmosis or do I understand you know, technology? Whatever. Yeah, right. Whatever. And the third stage, which is quite frankly what dis distinguishes, I think, a good teacher from, a, from an excellent teacher, is focusing on the children. What is this child telling me? Am I listening? Am I hearing? Am I seeing this child for the person that they are? And I often used to, I used to dismiss this and I've become much more um, uh, prone to believe this is important. When you look at a classroom, instead of seeing 25 individual children, you should see 25 family units. You should realize that that child lives within a larger ecosystem of community, of grandparents, of siblings, of perhaps poverty, all of the influences that are in that child's head. Mm -hmm. And the, the really exceptional teachers who are those who take that larger ecosystem into, into consideration and don't just look for the right answer to mm -hmm. the math problem. It sound that doesn't sound so difficult to be a teacher like that. Yeah, but well, it, apparently it, it is. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it is. I mean, um, again, the intellectual challenge, the puzzle of figuring out what this child needs and how I can deliver it. Mm -hmm. I think I think is. I mean, that goes back to my math training. I love a puzzle. I love a problem. I love to be able to think of all the different options that might work. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I think you asked Hans at one point, you know, about failures. I mean, I've had some colossal failures in my classroom. We'll talk about and, that later, Catherine. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> no, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Well, and just, I think one of the important things is to acknowledge it, to own it, and what the students really appreciate is when you come in, not groveling and, you know, head all down, but you say, you know, what we tried yesterday did not work. Okay, we and tried. I know it didn't work. You know it didn't work. And the students are somewhat relieved to realize that you are a human being who can take criticism and ask your students. There's a wonderful book written um, by a former dean of the School of Education, Ted Sizer, and it's called The Children Are Watching. <laughs> and when we are teaching, the children are watching our every move, how we dress, how we act with colleagues, how, what we have for lunch, and keeping that in your center focus, I think, is a big element of being really a, a truly uh, outstanding teacher. Right, right, right. Um, I want to talk about with you about uh, equity and excellence because that's that seems to be a, a sort of paradox. Uh, the educational system in the U.S. is uh, extremely competitive, especially when compared to, ne to the Netherlands. Um, there's a, a heavy uh, competition to get into universities like yours uh, at Harvard. Do you think it's a good thing that makes students excel, or do you think it cre creates inequality instead? What do you think? I yeah, um, the very difficult and a wonderful question. I think, I think that is why I call it a dilemma, the dilemma of excellence and equity. Mm -hmm. And by dilemma, I make a distinction rather than calling it the problem of of excellence and equity. By dilemma, I mean we never solve the problem, the the dilemma, the tension between the two. We manage it mm -hmm. and therefore 
Um, yes, there, there are many, many students in the United States who are left behind because of this highly competitive system that right. one can find. There are also, I think, on the, ec on the excellence side, I think we don't ask enough of our students. I think we need to raise the excellence. We need to raise the standards. We need to ask them, and we'll talk about this when we get into teaching, that what you do in the classroom is what the children will be able to do. So if you ask them low level questions, like what is two plus three? Well, then they can add, they can add and they can find that answer. But if you ask them is one half bigger or smaller than one third, they now need to be able to think a little bit. So we need to raise, I think, our standards in reasonable ways, not, right. not keeping people out, but in reasonable ways. We don't ask enough. And kids are bored. They don't want to go to school because it's the same old, same old. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> not all the students are the same. We all know that. Everyone has a different level. Uh, some require extra challenge and some need more guidance. How can you make sure that the different needs of the old students are met? Well, obviously, this is part of the incredible challenge of being an effective teacher. Right. And one of the things that I would urge viewers to think about are it's not just you as the teacher. You have at your resource, at your fingertips, the ability to work with other teachers, to ask the child's teacher from last year, what worked well with this child? What didn't work well? Talk to your colleagues. You have the ability to work with family. We in this country have ignored families. We feel like the moment the child comes to the classroom, that's just the child in front of us. But really, parents can tell you things about their children. And if I could just take a, a very brief moment to, right. to talk about what the role of parents. Imagine a, a, a primary school and imagine a first, you know, a five-year-old or a six-year-old coming to this school with the caregiver. It's the first day of school. And she's really kind of frightened and she's scared and she's never been in a school before. And frankly, the caregiver, the parent or the aunt or the uncle or the brother or sister is also a little nervous about sending the child to this of course, school. Of course. And, and uh, what happens is that the, they finally find their classroom. And at that moment, the caregiver or the family does a remarkable thing. They say, here. I give you my child. Perhaps the most impressive, most important, meaningful thing in the world to you. And we give them freely to our schools. And I feel like schools, in many cases, squander that and don't realize the immense trust that families have in schools. And we need to take that seriously right. and think about the gift that every parent has given us. Even your most irascible, difficult, challenging child is a gift in one way or another. Okay, okay. Uh, let's zoom out from the position of a teacher and, and zoom in on the, the school as an organization. You've mentioned that successful schools are, has a coherent culture. What exactly is this coherent culture and how does a school go about creating one? Well, that, that is much work that I do with school leaders. And um, there's, there is a very famous uh, uh, quote or, or a video game called Pac-Man, where Pac-Man goes across. We all know that. Yes, yes, yes. We all know that. Well, um, culture eats strategy for lunch every day. <laughs> So you may have the most exquisite staffing plan. You may have the best organization of children to teacher to time. But if you have a toxic culture, it will fail. Mm -hmm. And so how do we go about creating that? Well, the first thing is that when you visit a school, when I visit a school and I say, what business is this school in? I ask a teacher. 
And when I start getting three or four different answers, well, we're in the business of babysitting. We're in the business of child care. We're in the business of creating the best math students in the country. We're in the business of building self-esteem for children. When you start getting multiple answers, that tells me that things are not coherent mm -hmm. in, in the school. And therefore, you could have a third, third year teacher who says, I'm all about academic excellence. And you could have another third year teacher who says, I really care about how the child feels about herself. And those conflict. Right. Because when we come to the moment of promoting the child to the next year, the academic excellence person says, well, she didn't score well in her maths exams. So I think we should keep her back and retain her. And the personal well-being, the sort of self-esteem teacher says, but what would that do to her feeling about herself? And so now you have staff that are pushing and pulling the wagon in very different ways. And that's why coherence is so important. And may I say, for those of you who are school leaders, um, we have a phrase here, and I, I think I'll probably have to explain it, but it's, it, it's if you fish, if you're a person who goes out into the sea and fishes, you know that fish rot from the head. If you catch a fish and you leave it on the deck, the first part of the fish that will become rancid and ugly is the head. And so I use this when I'm talking to school leaders because if we have a toxic culture, it rots from the, from the head, top. Yeah, right. from the very top. And therefore those leaders need to have on their agenda every day, besides a smooth operating system, asking what, what does it feel like to work in this environment? And what can I do to make it more positive? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, we cannot avoid the, the, the subject of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in your opinion, what are the greatest challenges this pandemic has created for education and, and for the teachers working in the, in the educational system? Well, um, I'm sure that the teachers on, on, on our call today could enumerate many, many challenges. But I think what COVID has done for us, at least, is cause us to put in greater focus the inequities that we have in our society, mm -hmm. all, ranging all the way from internet access. Um, I think you and Holland do much better than we do. We have something like 20% of our students do not have a reliable con internet connection. That's quite a difference, yes. Yeah, yeah. and so we have, we have just the technical start that kids can't get online. The second thing that I think has, has become very aware is the personal connection. I, I taught in the fall at Harvard, I taught 150 students and there are all these little squares on the screen. And that just, for me, it's like tying my hands behind my back mm -hmm. because when I say something in a live classroom, I can do a scan and immediately see how it lands, how it's received. But with a little black screen, I can't see anything. No, no. And, and again, in our society, there have been some suggestions that it is not proper to ask students to turn on their cameras because they may be embarrassed about their home situation. They may have childcare that they're taking care of someone else. And so it, that is a huge tension of whether we should ask them to do this. But the, the other side of COVID is that I think we've learned some positive things. I think we have learned that, in fact, the teaching profession is remarkably nimble. I mean, in, for us, in the course of three weeks, everything went, went, went remote. Mm -hmm. And was it perfect? Absolutely not. Was it better than nothing? Yes. Absolutely. And so a couple of quick takeaways. One, I realized I can't do the same 
teaching moves, the same turn and talk, the same uh, kind of techniques that I use to get people. In. It just doesn't work. But I also know that I realized that rather than having students listen to me lecture about a topic, they could read about it before they come to class. Mm -hmm. And then we can, it's called a flipped classroom. Right. Then you know that. we can have a much more powerful conversation. Mm -hmm. So it showed me some new ways to approach teaching that were not part of my repertoire before. And perhaps um, we'll stay also, and perhaps we'll stay ahead. after the pandemic, right? Exactly. Exactly. It also showed us the importance of family mm -hmm. and the importance of having another caregiver involved in this equation of 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 learning. Um, that schools do not exist on an island. They are part of a community. And right. uh, so it's been a challenge. It's, as I say, it's, it's not been perfect. Um, our learning loss looks to be quite significant. Um, but I get a little frustrated with calling it learning loss. It's, it's simply a pause It's not like what the, you know, it's, it's measuring it against a, an abstract idea that they would have learned this much right, more. Right. <laughs> so don't call it a learning loss, no. just call it a pause and then move forward. Okay. Okay. Let's hope it's, it's going back to normal uh, real soon. Yeah. Um, tell, please tell me, Hans, quickly, where are you in the country with regard to remote learning right now? today? Um, well, as, as a matter of fact, I, I teach some, uh, I still teach uh, some some periods, uh, some classes. Um, one third of the students is in the classroom and two thirds is online. And you have the feeling that you constantly ignore both parties or do That's, them, do, I think that is the worst, where you're trying as a worst. teacher to I do prefer, both. Yeah, I prefer the online situation. And after the the, the spring holiday, we we uh, they they'll cut the, the classes in half. But it's not not the, the physical uh, environment we're used to. And um, I, I wish it was back to normal. But no. Um, All right, we're constantly comparing the U.S. situation with, uh, uh, with the Netherlands, of course. It goes without saying. Do you think the Netherlands and other countries around the world can learn from the American education system, or is it the other way around? You've been traveling, you have been working abroad, so you can have a broader perspective than we. What do you think about that? Well, I really think that the American hubris, if, if you know the word, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is, sort of self-centered and think we know it all is not well-founded. As I travel around, I'm struck by at least two things. Number one, um, there are many similarities in Jordan, in Ch Chile, in Brazil, in um, South Africa that I have found through my research that teachers face many of the same challenges. And I think we need not to look to the United States. Our, I really am pretty down on our education system. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to try to combine more international comparison and having teachers talk from different countries. In fact, what I'm thinking now, having done all these individual stories or cases about those five different countries, I'm now thinking about writing a book that looks at what is common, at the common problems. And your questions have identified many of them. Engagement, right. teacher apathy, um, child distracted by home or outside environments. And um, so I think there's more in common than different. And I would not, I'm not, I'm not an advocate for looking to America Um, at this moment in our education system. Mm -hmm. um, the advantage that I think you have in Holland, although I don't know your system well, is that it's smaller and you can get your hands around the system. I don't know what the relationship is with the government, but education in the United States is primarily a state function. It's a fair, not yeah. 
but it's not the national, so that we have 50 different rules and regulations. And this is its weakness as well as its strength. Historically, back in, the, in our colonial times, I know you think it's your modern times, but back in the 1600s, which we think was forever ago, and you think it was like yesterday. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we based our schools on local control, on what this community wanted for its children. And that still exists today, so that you may have a community in one part of the country that wants a certain kind of education for their students, and another community in another part of the country that wants an entirely different. And it is allowed to exist. So once again, it's this balance of how much centralization should we have, how much decentralization should we have. Mm -hmm. um, and I would feel I'd love, I'm, when this is all over, I'd love to come and visit to learn about Holland because you do have a reputation for a very strong system. I'm aware of it, particularly in the field of mathematics. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd love to see and to learn from you what you what you do. Okay, so yeah, let's, let's hope and pray that, that, that time will come and then we have another sit down and that's gonna be a live uh, situation. Um, um, what was the most valuable lesson you learned from your experience abroad? Well, you told already about that, that classrooms are classroom teachers, students, in fact, are the same everywhere. Um, and you talked before that about your own mistakes. You laughed at it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I said I would come back to it. How do you celebrate your own mistakes, uh, transforming your own mistakes into teachable moments? <laughs> uh, first of all, with some tears. Uh, <laughs> I have been known to uh, come into a classroom and apologize for either something that I've said or something that I did and unfortunately then burst into tears um, and the room just goes silent. Of course. And, but I think there's um, humility that this is teaching is a very complex activity and no one gets it perfect every day, day in and day out, month in and month out. So how I handle my failures is to own them to recognize that I've done them. I also surround myself with other teachers, assistants who uh, help me teach in the higher education setting and ask them to tell me how I did, to embrace feedback and critical feedback. And, you know, at first people are sort of, oh, well, you're the professor and I do as much as I possibly can to dispel the fact that I'm the authority and mm -hmm. they're just watching. The other point that I mentioned a little earlier is to ask the students. After all, let's think about them. They are sitting in classrooms day in and day out, year after year after year. Who could be more knowledgeable about what works than the students? So ask your students, at the end of each day, in each, each class, each ask term. them <clears throat> to come up with their questions. What part of the lesson was not clear? I do think something called exit cards, mm -hmm. little note cards. And I asked two questions. What did you learn today that you did not learn, be, did not know before? And second, what is still confusing? What questions do you have? And then in the evening, I look through the cards. And I start my lesson with their questions. Right. Okay. Uh, if every teacher would do that, it would be a, a new boredom, I guess. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's okay to to get feedback from your students right after your class. Right. Right. Uh, I think it's time for some uh, questions from the audience. So we'll uh, go to um, a different mic, a different camera. I, I am not hearing. No, no. There's some problem with the mic. Can we change that? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm an intern at the Atlantic Association and I would like to know um, what four years of Trump meant for the educational system in the US and what plans Biden has to improve perhaps the educational system. <sighs> you must take me to politics. <laughs> um, first of all, with uh, President Trump, um, we had a secretary of education who was the national uh, leader of education. And, and as I just said, surprisingly, she had less influence than you might have thought. But still, um, uh, the federal government, the national government pays for about 10% of the education in the country. And so with uh, his education secretary, there was a big push to privatize education to introduce more choice, more of a business model, more of a transactional model. And um, needless to say, it, it, did, it didn't gain that much traction because she did not have that much um, power. So if you really want to understand different political approaches to education in the United States, you really must look at the states at New York, at Texas, at California. These are our big states where there's a large number of students to understand. In terms of Biden, um, so far he uh, espouses, he's so busy doing so many other things at the moment, but he espouses um, a value of teachers. He selected, uh, again, his secretary of education was a former school person. Um, and he also, some people think he may be a little bit too close to the unions um, that we have in our country. And that troubles, um, again, some people. It's in our country, there's a real tension between public good and private good. And, you know, we've done very well with capitalism and with democracy, but some people feel that we may shift too far to um, democratic values um, under Biden. So um, I'm hopeful, but again, I would urge that you should look not so much at the federal policy of our presidents, but more at the local level, but it's a great question. Okay. Great question. I'm, I, I will just tell you personally that I am relieved that our news cycle, that when you turn the television on, we no longer have what President Trump has just said <laughs> um, and that it seems a little steadier, a little more even. Feel. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. There's also a question from the viewers at home. So I read it. What I it's an interesting question. Uh, it says in the Netherlands we moving we are moving toward uh, more responsibility for the student in their own school school career in terms of flex schedules, the possibility to plan their own tests, etc. They still have to follow all the courses, of course. Yet they can plan their own hours flexibly. Uh, is this something that you see in the U.S. as well? And do you believe that this kind of system for all ages and levels are suited? Wow, I, I, I had not heard that. Um, I am not entirely sure um, that it makes sense for all levels. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think offering children within some structure I'm thinking now about elementary children, right. um, allowing them to pursue their own interests is wise, but we're trying to build some foundations. And if it's just, um, you know, like today, I, I don't want to do any work. Um, I just want to sit and, and look out the window. Uh, I think that might be dangerous. Although Hans, I know that you were the head of a Montessori school, right? And I have enormous respect for the Montessori system. Um, and it really, as I understand it, and I'm sure you can inform us, children, it's actually quite structured, but it doesn't look structured. And so children are exposed to different ideas when they are ready. 
Right. So this giving some personal agency, I think, is important. For high school students, um, we're not doing this. So I'm fascinated to hear that you might do this. Once again, um, I'm all for it if we keep the rigor present. If we say, you can study mathematics when, when you are feeling like you want to do mathematics, but let's keep the level high. Um, because otherwise I think it could be really um, harmful. Right. But t- tell us quickly about Montessori. No. Do I have that right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, quite a remarkable uh, memory you have. Um, after the Montessori school, I was head of the Dalton school, and that is something more solid system with a lot of personal uh, responsibility for the students and time to, to fill in your own schedule. But uh, on the other hand, there are weekly tasks and they have to perform the task before they get yeah, passed. So um, there's a, but, but a lot of other schools, not Dalton, not Montessori, are experiencing uh, the same uh, urge to, to let go of the rigid system of a, a period with a, with a bell and, and things like that. So uh, I think that, that this development is quite um, strong in Holland. And, um, wonderful. Yeah, with with, with uh, results that are d- d- b- different. Not all the schools succeed in doing so, but I think there are, there's a lot of uh, new uh, experience in this field. Yes, yeah, yeah. So when you come to Holland, you must, uh, by all means, visit some some schools who are uh, uh, far ahead. Um, I'm giving the, the the floor to Iris for a question. Hi, um, my name is uh, Iris, or Iris, as uh, Hans said. Um, Hello. Hi. Um, we just had um, elections in Holland, and we're trying to form a new cabinet here, which is not really going well. Um, but if the government decides to invest more money in, um, in education, what should schools and universities do with that money, and which areas deserve the most attention? I'm so pleased you've asked that question because um, I may have, having been a secondary teacher, high school, middle school, older children, I have somewhat of a surprising answer, which is that if there were more money spent in education, I believe it should be focused on children age three to grade three. Essentially those six years of early childhood education and the first three years of primary school. Really, if we invested there, I think many of our later problems would diminish. We have very good research, at least in the United States, that tells us that if a child is able to read at grade level in when she is nine, or grade three would be for us. I'm not sure how it translates for you. If that child is able to read at grade level at age nine, the outcomes all the way through high school are known to be much better. But if a child is behind by by age nine, it's very difficult to make that up. And there are all sorts of outcomes, pregnancy, dropping out of school, um, homelessness, many things. So if I were to give you advice, I would say, and the universities as well, the more that we can understand about early learning, the more uh, for the universities, and I know mine is focusing a great deal on cognition, on thinking about how, watching and understanding how the brain works, um, I think that would be a very powerful intervention. We can't do everything, but if we focused on those six years and looked at nutrition and looked at home home learning and looked at education and looked at social emotional well-being, I think it would alleviate the problems later on in, in the year, in the years. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does. Yeah, thank you. Do you agree? Um, Well, I was actually, I think it's an interesting answer as well. I mean, I have been a teacher, but I quit teaching um, and I taught history. 
Um, and I actually experienced that there were less hours of history teaching in uh, secondary mm -hmm. school, uh, in mm -hmm. high school, of course. Um, so I'm just a little sad that it ha this happened. So I was actually wondering if you agree that there should be more money to like the, the technical side, so mathematics or science side, or if there should be a better balance maybe? Absolutely. So with regard to subjects, <clears throat> I, I am sorry that you've left teaching because obviously you understand the challenges and, and it perhaps may have enjoyed it. I think we need to do more interdisciplinary work. We need to engage history teachers with math teachers, with social studies teachers, um, because as the phrase is history, if we don't learn it, we are doomed to repeat it. And um, uh, let me give you very quickly an example that when I was teaching high school mathematics, I had students who weren't really interested in mathematics, but they loved history. And so as part of their assignment in, in my classes, I would assign them a historical topic. Like when, <clears throat> when did we invent integers? Or what do we know about uh, Descartes or Plato or Euclid? And students at first would sort of grumble and say, wait a minute, this is not a history class. <laughs> We're supposed to learn math here. But understanding the role of different subjects and how they relate to each other is the kind of education we should be giving students. Because when they leave us, they're not just doing math or just doing history or just doing science. All of those factors are put together. And as I said earlier, what we ask students to do in classrooms is exactly what they will be able to do. So if we ask them to do low level, you know, mundane, um, technical skills, that's what they'll be able to do. And it's not preparing them for life and for the future. Oh, I do agree. Thank you. I, I hope you'll come back to teaching. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> Who knows? quite a coincidence because <laughs> the next question from uh, viewers at home uh, is about teachers leaving school after a, a few years, or after a year even, uh, of um, operating as a teacher. Is this a problem known to the United States also? We have... Uh, Absolutely. Okay. We, we lose something like almost 50% of our teachers in the first five years. How do we keep them abroad, aboard? We keep them aboard by changing the structure of the school, which Hans, you know well, from mm -hmm. having led some of these schools. We keep them aboard by not putting them in full-time the first day and saying, good luck. We keep them involved for the university people who are listening by continuing our relationships with the students who graduate from us. A criticism that I've had of Harvard is they do, I think, a fine teacher education program. They graduate and we say, bye-bye, have a nice life, hope, hope things work out. Teachers learn about teaching in four places. One, when they are teachers, when they are students, they're watching all the time. Right. Number two, when they're in a teacher education program, when we're studying different approaches. Three, when they are doing practice teaching with supervision from a mentor. But the fourth area where teachers really learn about teaching that we forget is when they are teaching. So universities need to stay present, need to continue their professional education with teachers to support them. And please don't put them into the most difficult classes with the most difficult kids, with a, you know, an entire schedule that gives them no time to eat lunch or go to the bathroom. We need to gradually put them into teaching, not unlike what we do with the medicine in the medical field. Mm -hmm. We gradually increase the responsibility. Okay. Okay. Um, this is a and pay them more. Pay them more money. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, the money is the problem. The people are. I mean, the number of, of students um, uh, 
uh, with the perspective of being a teacher that's increasingly. Um, well, as a then another question from, from home, so to speak. As a beginner in the field of teaching, two years of experience, and she's still in the field, what can you tell me about ways in which I can stimulate my students to think critically? In my opinion, it's crucial for young people to form their own opinions and to expose themselves to information around us. I feel that there is a tendency among my students to accept things quite fast and that they tend to find out, to find it difficult to form their own opinion and be critical of the things around them within the school and outside the school. Besides creating a safe environment in the classroom, what can help to them to develop a skill of critical thinking? A wonderful question and a question after my own heart. I uh, have specialized in my teaching using the case method of instruction, which is to present a, a challenging dilemma, a situation where reasonable people disagree and ask the students to debate, to explore the two sides, to weigh the different opinions. I think we tend often to deliver knowledge in schools as little packets and here, this is, this is what you should think about integration. Mm -hmm. This is what you should think about gender. This is what you should think about, um, you know, societal issues. So we need to ask the students and engage them in these debates, teaching them not only how to listen to each other, but how to understand the different points of view. And often in my classes where we'll have a, um, a debate, let's take a topic like, should we divide the gifted and talented students separate from the other students? And, and you can imagine at Harvard, we have tremendous debates about this because mm -hmm. many of those Harvard students benefited by being pulled away and separate. And so when we have the debate, I say to those who are on the side of, yes, we should separate them and give them special services, I ask them to take the other side, to take the other side and argue against themselves. And this, I think, helps teach critical thinking. Mm -hmm. It helps teaching, understanding how the other in a debate or a discussion or an argument might be framing the argument. It allows the nuance to develop. And that, I think, helps students become much more critical thinkers. But if you look for your, for your own research, look into teaching by the case method, presenting dilemmas to, to students. And don't be afraid that it's not resolved, but the learning that you are teaching is how to look at a complicated situation and understand the nuance and the, and the specific developments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, talking about the environment in which uh, students are living, how can teachers, as someone from home, uh, how can teachers compete with the professionally produced games, videos, films, etc., whose main goal is to keep the attention and create addiction? How do you cope with that? That, I read that question ahead of time, and I thought that was one of the most thoughtful questions I think I've had in, in many, many years. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, we are developing into a culture of quick sound bites of 20 second attention spans of uh, video games that quickly uh, give satisfaction. And right. indeed, they are designed to become addictive. I think we have to try to, in our teaching, raise situations and puzzles that students are willing and eager to understand the answer to. So presenting uh, a challenge of, uh, here's, here's a, good, a good example. For, for young children, um, when we move into, for those of you who teach elementary, we move into fractions, into rational numbers. Asking a child, uh, a question like, what is one half plus one third? Well, what we know about student learning is they build their understanding based on prior understanding. So if I understood that one plus two, one plus one was two and two plus three was five, the answer I would give to that question is two fifths. 
And so rather than just saying, no, that's wrong, you need to ask why. You need to think about the questions and move the level of cognition, the demand, the cognitive demand up so that students are thinking and puzzling about why and how do things work and when do they work, when do they not work? Because what's happening in the technology, and I, I'm puzzled by this question as well as a super question, What's happening is everything's being reduced to small bits of information and they're not being connected to each other, whether interdisciplinarily or within the subject itself. And so we really need, I think, to, to elevate what we do in the classroom to stimulating questions. The questions are just beyond where the student is. It's uh, Vygotsky. Mm -hmm. talks about the zone of proximal um, relationship. Just push them a little bit further and be uh, an inquirer next to your students. You don't have all the answers. Ask questions. Ask the students to ask each other questions. Because I found that when you ask students to write questions, write exam questions, they ask the hardest questions that, that one can imagine. So engaging something that engages beyond a passive, just watching and a lazy, a lazy learning, if you will. Okay. But it's, uh, it's a great question. I don't know that I've answered it entirely. Well, I think, I think you did a terrific job. And uh, looking at the clock, um, uh, I'm sorry to say that the hour has passed. So I want to thank you for your time and your excellent advices and some wonderful answers and your wisdom and hopefully we'll meet again uh, hopefully when you come to to the netherlands and we have another sit down and to the viewers at home thank you for your watching and hopefully we will we will see you uh, each other at the next event of the atlantic education committee so wonderful and let me just quickly say hans it's been a real privilege and an honor to be able to chat with you and, and with your colleagues there in right. Holland. And I want to simply implore everyone to think about the power of education. What could be more important than helping a child learn? And so you do wonderful work. I know it is hard, but I hope you find some level of it fulfilling. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Catherine, um, and nogmaals uh, a, a goodbye to the viewers in, at home, and we'll see each other someday, someday soon, I hope. Bye-bye.